Hello, friends, and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is John Lomakang. Thank you for taking the time to join us on our continued excursion through the book of Hebrews. This quarter of the lesson is In These Last Days, the Message of Hebrews. And this third lesson is The Promised Son. If you'd like to join us in following us with a lesson, go to 3ABN Sabbath School panel.com and download a lesson, but better yet, Find a local Seventh-day Adventist church, go in and tell them 3ABN sent you and join them for an in-person study through the book of Hebrews. But nonetheless, get your Bible and join us for this excursion in this next hour through exciting messages found in the book of Hebrews. Friends, welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School. We are always excited when you take the time to join us. And if you've been a regular, you know that this is something we enjoy while we're sharing what God has revealed to us. We are praying that God reveals something more. And we don't want to come across as the experts because God's word is far too deep for us to be able to master anything mm -hmm. that is in it. However, the writer has done an excellent job on the book of Hebrews. We're just on lesson number three. We've got about uh, 10 more left, and we encourage you to join us every week for what we know is going to be exciting, one of my favorite books. And I think the panel has often expressed their joy of studying the book of Hebrews. Am I right? That's Amen. right. Amen. That's right. So we have a great panel today. If you were here last week or the week before that, the family is the same, and we're going to be excited to have you stay with us. All you need is a Bible and 57 minutes. <laughs> to my immediate left is Pastor James Rafferty. Good to have you here, James. It's good to be here, John. Yeah, James and John, I think there's something behind that in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, the lady herself, Jill Marconi. Good to have you here, Jill. Thank you, Pastor John. Good to be here. Yes, you, you, universally, you are called the list lady. <laughs> I don't know where they got that from, but I think it fits. Ryan, good to have you here. It's a blessing always. I'm excited. Going to be talking about Jesus as the divine creator today. Okay, and... On this panel, I think John Dinsey has been here the longest ahead mm -hmm. of a Latino. Uh, Pastor John Dinsey, good to have you here. It's a blessing to be here, and it's a wonderful lesson. Okay. Well, then why don't you have prayer for us before we dive into sure. the lesson? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing of the book of Hebrews that is a feast of good things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We pray that as we study, your Holy Spirit will help us understand even more. Lead us and guide us, and we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. We pray for your blessing upon all those that endeavor to seek to understand your holy scriptures. And we pray, Lord, that your name may be honored and glorified in all things. In Jesus' holy and blessed name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. We're going to start with Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. And uh, Saturday and Sunday lesson, or Sabbath and Sunday lesson, and then we're going to see what the Lord has in store for us. But let's go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. We're talking about, in some real sense, the pre-existence of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, there are what I call three Genesis in the Bible. Genesis, obviously, mm -hmm. then John chapter 1, then right. Hebrews chapter 1. Now, Genesis takes us to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Pretty much our solar system, our world, the place that we call home, but then John goes further. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He goes mm -hmm. even further back than that. And then Hebrews talks about the Lord through His Son creating the worlds. Mm -hmm. And uh, astronomers tell us that, that there are billions of galaxies, which if we are faithful, one day we'll get a chance to visit maybe all of them, <laughs> because that's what immortal life gives us the opportunity to do. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, as we consider the memory text the, um, in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. I'll read that for you. And it says, Has in these last days, speaking about the Father appointing His Son, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, mm -hmm. who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself 
purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Mm. When you read that text, you don't realize how much ground is covered. Mm. Starts by when he created the worlds, long before our existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then sending him and appointing him heir of all things, and then sending him to show the world the expressed image of the Father. Yeah. Mm. And then his ministry, his death, burial, resurrection, then sitting down at the right hand of majesty. Mm. <laughs> Two verses that takes us through quite a bit of space and time. When you think about the beginning story of the Bible, we call the great controversy, the unfolding of the lineage of humanity, as well as the conflict between good and evil. We find right after Adam and Eve sinned, God made a promise. And the promise was he was going to send a seed who would deliver all of humanity from the woes of sin. As Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Also, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, speaking about the best Adam could give us, as in Adam, all die. Mm. But the converse, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. There are many contrast scriptures in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, Two is one of them. Another one is Romans 6, 23. Mm -hmm. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm -hmm. Now these contrasting scriptures show us what we deserve and what we don't deserve. Mm -hmm. It shows us the plight of humanity and the promise of divinity. And so today we're going to walk through uh, some aspects of how God works, but then we're going to look about in these last days, which is mm -hmm. the focus of uh, Sunday's lesson in these last days. We know if we've been studying the word of God that the Lord has been speaking through apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers throughout the ages. But in these last days, the message is so vitally important that we can dive down to the book of Revelation and see the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is speaking directly to us through the son about the final act in the drama of the ages. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 17 and see how this promise includes all who are open to being used of God. Acts 2 verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out mm -hmm. my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old, old men shall dream dreams. And then we find on my manservant and maidservant, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So we're living in the day and age where prophecy is a significant part of how this controversy is going to end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the first prophecies in scripture, however, is in the book of Genesis. Look at Genesis chapter three, verse 15, the prophecy that showed generations long after Adam that the promise the Lord made in the garden is going to be fulfilled mm -hmm. not only through his life, but in the final eradication of sin. Genesis 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the serpent, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall mm. bruise his heel. Mm. Now, if you want to kill somebody, you don't hang them by the heel, mm -hmm. you hang them <laughs> by the head. Mm. In this case, the Lord is talking about the ultimate victory over Satan, but in the process, he's going to receive a sustaining wound that is for his heel meaning it will hinder to some degree the beautiful, unmarred, glorious Christ. And throughout ceaseless ages, we will see what our redemption has cost. Mm. That's why people say, well, salvation is free. I say, no, it's not. It's yeah. expensive. Mm. Yeah. It has cost God everything and Jesus gave us his best. But it's a gift to us, free to us, but by no means, if you get a gift, don't ever think it's free. It does cost something to make mm -hmm. and something to purchase. Mm -hmm. let's, look at the, let's look at the spiritual fulfillment of that prophecy made in Genesis chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. All right. I'm going to turn it with you. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. The Bible says, Jill, do you have that? I do. Read that for me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Mm -hmm. And keep going. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Mm, that's right. So the Lord, that is the chapter that the writer of Hebrews recognizes. Wait a minute. The Lord promised and he fulfilled. Mm. Now, the devil knows that the Lord was victorious because the Bible says he knows that he has but a short time. Mm -hmm. 
So he knows that his time is limited because the Lord defeated him at the cross, but more specifically, because of the empty tomb, that mm. victory was complete. Amen. But then not only yeah. defeating the devil, but also bringing freedom to all of those who are all their lifetime in fear of bondage, held and held captive by habits or even just by the thought of what was in their past. Mm -hmm. But let's look at a couple of more prophecies that the Bible talks about, a prophecy and a fulfillment. Another one we get is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Let's look at that very quickly. Prophecy and fulfillment. Okay, for this we say to you, and we don't often think of this as a prophecy, mm. but in fact it is because it has not yet been fulfilled. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, mm. with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now let's look at the confirmation of the fulfillment. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 and 24. For as in Adam all die, mm. even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Mm -hmm. And then let's look at another prophecy. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. So we're looking forward to the day when the Lord puts an end to all rule, mm -hmm. all authority and all power. Mm -hmm. When he really uh, delivers all of us and delivers us to the Father as he delivers the kingdom to the Father. Mm -hmm. The kingdom is not physical dimensions of a building. The kingdom, in fact, is made up of sons and daughters of God mm -hmm. who are finally freed from the eternal bondage that the great controversy has brought. Let's look at another prophecy. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. Looking at prophecy and fulfillment. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Mm. For behold, I create new heavens and a new mm. earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Now that's the confirmation that one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. But let's look at the spiritual fulfillment of that, because not only is the Lord going to make new heavens and a new earth, but look what Paul the Apostle says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's here and that is now. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the Apostle Paul confirms that once again in Galatians 6, 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but mm. a new creation. Yes. So we are new creations in Christ, not in the new earth alone, Amen. but we are new creations in mm. Christ even right now. That's right. We can experience that new life. We can look forward to the day when all things are made new. I talk about we are delivered from the penalty of sin, yeah. from the power of sin, and finally from the presence of sin. That's a prophecy that I'm looking forward to being fulfilled. One more prophecy very quickly in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. In the days of these kings, mm -hmm. the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms mm -hmm. and it shall stand forever. Now let's look at the spiritual fulfillment because we know that's the future. That's what's going to happen. God is going to establish mm -hmm. a permanent kingdom. But look at the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, listen to what he said. He answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, mm. nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. So watch this. Before we get into the kingdom, God wants to get the kingdom in us. Amen. Amen. And so that's going to be the beauty. The kingdom is already in us by the promise of Christ, by his shed blood. But one day, the kingdom that is in us will get us to the kingdom that we will be in. Amen. 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 Good stuff. My name is James Rafferty, and I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled, God Has Spoken to Us by His Son. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 1 verses one through four. We do have a little bit of uh, duplication here, addition here. So we're really going to know these verses by the time we're done with our lesson for this week. Right. Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four. Let's just read them together. Powerful, powerful, actually beautiful verses. I especially love this first one. Hebrews one, verse one, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days mm. spoken unto us by his son 
whom he hath appointed heir of all things, mm -hmm. and by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, mm -hmm. being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Sundry times and in divers manners. Mm. What does that mean? I don't know what it means. <laughs> Actually, I do know what it means, but it's beautiful. It it's is. beautiful, poetic King James language. And what God is saying here basically is, is that God is a communicator. God has been communicating with us by the prophets and that communication has only intensified down mm -hmm. through the ages. That's right. In other words, God has not lessened his communication. God has increased his communication <laughs> because the lack of communication is an evidence of, well, let's say a spirit or an attitude of abandonment. When you don't communicate, you have abandoned, you have walked away from, you have, you have discontinued relationship. And that's kind of what happened in the Garden of Eden. When we go back to the Garden of Eden, we see uh, implied there clearly that Adam and Eve walked with God in the, in the cool of the evening every day. And one day God comes and he's looking for Adam and Eve in the normal location where they meet together and talk together about the day's activities and they weren't there. Mm -hmm. And so God starts calling for them. God is a communicator. Adam, Eve, where are right. you? Where are you? Are they so busy that, and of course, God knows where they are and God knows what has happened, but God is working through this whole process for our sake mm -hmm. because God is trying to tell us as fallen human beings that even though we stop communicating with him, even though we abandon him, mm -hmm. and in that case, it was because they were afraid of him, God has not stopped communicating with us. God has not abandoned us. And so the book of Hebrews opens up with this powerful declaration. You know, we, we believe the book of Hebrews was written by mm -hmm. Paul, but it's so different from all of his other mm -hmm. epistles where he introduces himself as an apostle of God, as apostle of Christ and, and grace and peace be unto you. He gets right to the point because we could understand that Paul is per perhaps trying to reach Hebrews in this epistle to the Hebrews more than any other group of people. And he's trying to remind them that God has never stopped communicating with mm -hmm. them because that is the key. That is the power that wins our hearts. God is a communicator and God has continued to communicate to us. And it's that goodness of God that actually leads us to repentance. It Amen. leads us to turn our lives around. So God has never stopped communicating and his communication has only increased in intensity from the time of our sin until the very end, Jesus Christ himself manifesting, taking uh, uh, our humanity upon himself and communicating to us of the goodness and the love of God. So in, in the original Greek, the lesson goes on to say here, Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four is only one sentence. And I'm thinking in my mind, Maybe Paul thought, if I've only got one sentence, <laughs> just one chance to speak to my Hebrews, I'm just going to get this sentence out there. And this is going to be the sentence. Mm -hmm. You ever feel that way? Right. You've only got one sentence right. to it. So it's just one sentence. <laughs> and and it's, it's, the author says, it has been argued that this, this is the most beautiful in all the New Testament from the point of view of its rhetorical <laughs> artistry. It is the main assertion that God has spoken to us through his son, Jesus. Now, the Jews in the first century, and you know, you can see this when you end the Old Testament with the book of Malachi and you move to the New Testament, you've got a huge gap there. You've got a huge space there mm -hmm. where it seems like God is not communicating. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes silence increases the anticipation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God is about to communicate, get this, we've got all of the pre-show taking place, but now the grand finale is mm -hmm. taking place. And there's this time of silence, there's this time of anticipation. God's been communicating through the prophets, but now mm -hmm. he's going to communicate in person. Mm -hmm. Amen. And if we're thirsty, if we're hungry, if we haven't heard from God, you know, separation they say makes the heart grow fonder. Mm -hmm. You, you separate from people for a while and you just need that, you want that. And so God comes in the person of Jesus Christ. He comes to remind us that he has never and will never stop communicating with us. It's kind of like the anticipation of Jesus Christ creating hunger in our hearts for God's communication. But now, 
through Jesus, mm. God is speaking to them. And, and the, the, the quarterly says again, uh, I say God is speaking to them through Jesus because he's always been speaking mm. to them through Jesus in a sense. He never stopped speaking to them through Jesus. In the Old Testament, it was Christ. He was the rock that followed them. He was the one that communicated. He was the one that inspired, of course, through the Holy Spirit. But basically when Jesus comes, he negates all the false ideas of God's abandonment. Hmm. God has hmm. never abandoned us. He's never n stopped communicating to us. That's right. Hmm. So God's revelation, the quarterly goes on to say, through Jesus, however, was superior to the revelation that God made through the prophets because Jesus is a greater means of revelation. He is God himself who created the heavens and the earth and rules the universe. So for Paul, the deity of Christ is never in question. It's all but assumed. Yes, previous revelations were, were lesser than the actual revelation of God, but they were, these previous revelations were still the revelations of God, specifically, for example, the Ten Commandments spoken mm -hmm. by the voice of God himself. Mm -hmm. The quarterly goes on to say, also for Paul, the Old Testament was the word of God. The same God who spoke in the past continues to speak in the present. The Old Testament, Testament communicated a true knowledge of God's will. However, it goes on to say, it was possible to understand its fuller meaning only when the Son mm. arrived on the earth. That's why Jesus said so many times, you have heard, but I say. It has been written, but I say. He was bringing fuller meaning to everything that had been written in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The author goes on to say, in the author's mind, the Father's revelation in the Son provided the key to understanding the true breadth of the Old Testament. I just want to say amen to that. Mm -hmm. right. Just like the picture on the box of a jigsaw puzzle provides <laughs> the key to finding the correct place for every one of its pieces. Now, how many of us can relate to that? If you've ever done a jigsaw puzzle, you're like, show me that, let me look at that box because there it is already done and you're just looking for where those pieces fit. And so it is that Jesus brought so much of the Old Testament to light. Meanwhile, the author goes on to say, Jesus came to be our representative and our savior. Mm -hmm. He would take our place in the fight and defeat the serpent. Similarly, in Hebrews, Jesus is the pioneer or the captain or the forerunner or the champion of our faith. <laughs> Hebrews 2 verse 10. He fights for us and represents us. I love that. He fights for us and he represents us. Mm -hmm. This also means that what God did for Jesus, our representative, the Father wants to do for us. Yeah. He who exalted Jesus at his right hand also wants us to sit down with Jesus on his throne. Now just take mm -hmm. that in, friends. God promises that those who overcome will sit down with Christ on his throne. That is the promise given yeah. to us in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. And I love that. So God's message to us in Jesus includes not only what Jesus said, but also what the Father did through him to him, all for our, the, the quarterly says, temporal and eternal benefit, and I added the word, and spiritual benefit. Mm -hmm. So let's just think about this for a second. There's one question we're going to close with here in our lesson for Monday. Think through what it means that Jesus, God, came to this earth and why should this truth bring so much hope to us? Mm. Think mm. through what that means. What does it mean that Jesus came to this earth, it, that God came to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ, and That's why right. should that bring so much hope mm. to us? I believe that one of the things that we see in that picture of God coming in the person of Jesus Christ and why it brings so much hope is because it reminds us of God's undying love. God mm -hmm. so loved the world that he gave his only begotten yeah. son. Stop right there because that first part of that verse belongs to every human being on planet earth. Yes, there was a purpose for that love, that unconditional love to the world was so that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. But God still so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is a past tense fact. God has given the gift. And as Pastor John said earlier, that gift costs something. That's right. And that gift has been put on our door. It's been delivered to our front doorstep. Why are we just letting it sit out there? When it's been purchased and it's been delivered, God says it's a gift. Take it, mm. unwrap it, use it. It's yours, you need yeah. it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, James. Amen. Thank you so much. As you know, if you've been following us from week to week, we're just getting started. Mm. So don't go away. We have three more days and we'll be right back.
Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Well, welcome back. We told you we won't be going anywhere, so thank you for taking the time to come back with us. Right now, Jill is going to take Tuesday. He is the radiance of the glory of God. What a long sentence, but I'm looking forward to what you have. <laughs> thank you so much, Pastor John and Pastor James. Incredible foundation for this lesson. And I'm staying in those four verses as well. We're in Hebrews chapter one, and we're gonna spend the entire balance of my time on two phrases. The brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person. All 10 minutes on those two phrases. And we have seven takeaways. So let's read that and then we'll unpack it. We're gonna pick it up in verse two. I know we've already read it, but I just want you to see these two phrases in that context. Hebrews 1 verse two. Of course, this is God speaking. God has in these last days spoken to us, to whom? By his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. We won't touch on creation because I think Ryan's gonna talk about mm -hmm. that. Verse three, who being the brightness of his glory, that's our first phrase, and the express image of his person, that's the second phrase and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So what about these two phrases? The brightness of his glory. The word brightness in Greek, this is the only time it's used in the New Testament, and it means radiance, literally someone who shines from within. The brightness of his glory. What does his glory mean? Now the lesson brings out, and we are gonna touch on it, the lesson brings out his glory is the visible manifestation of his presence. And that's truly biblical, clearly biblical, and we see it. But I also wanna touch on the fact that his glory also is his character. Mm -hmm. So if we look at it from both perspectives, we see the brightness of his glory, the brightness of his character. And then we'll also look at his visible presence. So let's look at both. Let's start with character. For that, we're going to Exodus 33. Exodus chapter 33, and of course, this is Moses speaking to God. Exodus 33, we pick it up in verse 18. And he, Moses, said, show me your glory. Mm -hmm. And what did God say? He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And you know, if you jump over one chapter, we see the same thing represented in Exodus 34, where God says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. What is he saying? My glory is my character. Mm -hmm. When Moses said, show me your glory, he wanted to see the character. God revealed his character. Mm -hmm. God revealed his goodness. God revealed his mercy. That's right. If you look at the book of Philippians, I love the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter two, verses 14 and 15, we have this interesting text. It says, do all things, how? Without complaining mm -hmm. and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Mm -hmm. How are we to shine? As mm -hmm. lights in mm -hmm. the world. Amen. Takeaway number one, you and I are called to shine with his character to the world. That is our calling as mm -hmm. Christians, to reveal the character, the glory of God. Jesus came to reveal the character of the Father. He came to show what God was like. But you and I, in addition, are called to reveal his character to the world. We're mm -hmm. called to share his light. We're called to live his life. We're called to represent him to the world. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the brightness of his glory, not just being his character, which it is, but let's look at it being the visible presence of God. 
For that, we're going back to Exodus, Exodus chapter 24. You know, we have this whole uh, giving of the Sinaitic covenant. Exodus 19, it begins, God carries them on eagles' wings. Exodus 20, we have the 10 commandments or 10 promises that God gives. And then we see, of course, the ratification of the covenant in blood in Exodus 24, but we're picking it up in verse 15. Exodus 24, verse 15, Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire mm -hmm. on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. God blessed his people with a visible manifestation of his presence. This was the consuming fire. This was the cloud that covered mm -hmm. the mountain. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12 tells us what, 1229, our God is a consuming fire. That's right. Takeaway number two, Jesus came as the visible presence of God. He came as the light of the world. John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Right. Jesus came as the visible presence of God. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number three, this is still dealing with the visible presence of God. The presence of God, this is the brightness of his glory. It brings terror to the wicked. Mm -hmm. We would think the presence of God is pleasant, but as Pastor James already talked about, Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. when they sinned, they didn't want to communicate. They didn't want the presence of God. I'm reminded of the sixth seal in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter six, remember that the wicked, this is just before the coming of Christ, and they're terrified mm -hmm. at the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. cry out to the rocks and say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Mm -hmm. The presence of God, it brings terror to the wicked. Takeaway number four, the presence of God provides guidance to his children. Yeah. I love that. We see this in Exodus 40. But we see this whole picture of the children of Israel and the encampment. And when the pillar of cloud moved, they picked up their tents and they moved along with the presence of God. It provided guidance. It provided direction. Greg has always said, we are called to the ministry of 3ABN. And right now, the pillar of cloud is here. Mm. But if for whatever reason, God picks up our pillar of cloud and moves it on, that means we need to follow. Mm -hmm. That means mm -hmm. we need to go where God leads. Amen. In Exodus 40, verse 34, we see this. The cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting. This is the visible presence of God. This is the brightness of his glory that we talked about in Hebrews. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Jump down to verse 36. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in their journeys. They would progress. Mm -hmm. But if the cloud was not taken up, Pastor John, they did not journey mm -hmm. till the day it was taken up. The presence of God provides guidance to his children. Takeaway number five, I love this. The presence of God brings joy. Remember we said the presence of God brings terror to the wicked mm -hmm. and it does, but the presence of God brings joy to his children. Mm -hmm. Psalm 1611, you will show me, that's God, will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Oh. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Mm -hmm. Do you lack joy in your life? Seek the presence of God. Mm -hmm. The presence of God brings joy. Takeaway number six, the presence of God brings rest. Exodus 33, verse 14. Mm -hmm. And he said, God is speaking, my presence will go with you and I will give you mm -hmm. rest. Amen. The presence of God brings rest. Now in our final moments, let's look at the second phrase. We already looked at the brightness of his glory being God's character, which we are called to represent, as well as the visible presence of God. But what is the express image of his person? It's very fascinating to me. The express image is actually a word in Greek that is a tool used for engraving. Mm. It's a mold or a stamp. So you know what a stamp is. It gives the exact representation, the exact likeness. There is a perfect correspondence in essence, in being, in likeness, in character between the Father and the Son. 
Remember Jesus said to Philip, this is in John 14, 9, Jesus said, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? That's because Jesus is the mold, the exact representation of the Father. Mm -hmm. John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Takeaway number seven, Jesus came to reveal the Father. If you know Jesus, you know the Father. He came to reveal God. Just as no one has seen the Son except through its brightness, we can only know the Father through Jesus. So our takeaways, you and I are called to share the character of God to the world. Jesus came as the visible presence of God. The presence of God brings terror to the wicked, but it brings guidance, joy, and rest to the righteous. And Jesus came to reveal the Father. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Wonderful foundation laid. Thank you guys so much. I have uh, Wednesday's lesson. My name is Ryan Day. And Wednesday's lesson is entitled, Through Whom He Made the Universe. The opening statement here says, Hebrews affirms that God created the world through or by Jesus and that Jesus sustains the world with His powerful Word. And so there's no denying that the Bible is very clear how Christ is creator, that he is responsible for creating all things. I think mm -hmm. of John chapter one, verse one, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. But it goes on to say that by or through him, all things were made and nothing was made unless it was made by him. So in this case, Christ is creator. We even see this in Hebrews chapter one, verses two and three. We've read these verses many times, but hey, we might as well read them again, right? Because the mm -hmm. more we hear them, the more we remember them. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, it says, uh, it says, has in these last days, speaking of Christ, spoken to us by his son, through whom he has appointed heirs of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, whom being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So before we go on any further for any more comments, commentary on this idea that Christ, which made all things, he is the, all the universe was made by him. Let's jump back to some text in the Old Testament here because the lesson brings out that many people have a discrepancy when they read some of the Old Testament texts mm -hmm. where it talks about God alone being creator. And then they get to the New Testament and they read these texts where it says Christ is creator. Well, who's the creator, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 24. And then we're going to skip over one chapter and read Isaiah 45 verse 18. But right now, Isaiah 44 verse 24. Notice what the Bible says. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. That word Lord is Yehovah. Thus says the Lord, Yehovah, your Redeemer. Amen. And he who formed you from the womb, mm -hmm. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretched out the heavens That's all right. alone, who spreads abroad the earth. Notice this, by myself. Right. And so again, many people read this and say, wait a second, God created, but yet Jesus created? Again, Isaiah 45, verse 18. Let's read this one. Isaiah 45, verse 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, mm -hmm. okay, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. Right. I am the Lord, mm -hmm. and here it is, and there is no other. There's some yeah. singularity statement here of I am God. There is no other. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that created all things. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Got to read this one as well. It fits right into this theme we're talking about. Nehemiah verse, or chapter 9, verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, mm -hmm. the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the right. seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Mm -hmm. And so the idea, which the lesson brings out very intelligently, some think that Jesus was merely the instrument through whom God created, right? This is not possible because first, of course, as we read for Paul, Jesus is the Lord who created the world. He's not merely a helper. And some people see it that way. I hear people mm -hmm. all the time. They'll say, well, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord 
but God created. Mm -hmm. And the idea is there is that somehow Jesus is somehow some lesser God or some demigod, or in many cases, some people deny uh, just outright the divinity of Christ and say, well, there's, there's God and then there's Christ. But when you get into the book of Hebrews and many other passages throughout the Bible, we are very, very clear on the fact that Jesus is God and he is creator. He created all things. Uh, I love Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 10. Uh, we also find this being reaffirmed in Psalm chapter 102, verses 25 through 27, which is where Paul uh, draws these words from. But again, Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to read verses 8 and 10. Notice what the Bible says. But to the Son, he says, your throne, here it is, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Mm. And then verse 10 with that. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Let's make this clear. Jesus is God. Jesus is creator. There's no way of getting around that. I have to emphasize that again because just recently, even in my own ministry, uh, as I travel around and I get to speak with many different people and go to many different churches, there's a movement. There's a movement of people that seem to be preaching this idea that there's this one true God and it's the Father and Jesus is not God at all. But yet they're okay with saying he's creator. But the fact that he is creator makes him God. Mm. In fact, the Bible says it. You can't get around it. Jesus Christ is God. He is creator. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 says that the universe was created by or through, in this case, the Father, because it's talking about what the Father is doing through Jesus. And so this is where some confusion comes in. Wait a second. The Father is creator and the Son is also creator. The exact same expressions, again, that we find in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 are applied to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, which we read earlier. The Father created and Jesus created. Did you hear that? Mm. The <laughs> Father created and Jesus created, right? We see this in Hebrews 1 and 2 uh, and 10, also Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. There is a perfect agreement between the Father and Son in purpose and activity. This is part of the mystery of the Godhead, right? Yeah. How do you explain these things? Only God can fully explain these things. Jesus created and God created. Though that is refer referencing the Father. But there is only one creator, okay? God. God is creator, of course, which implies that Jesus is in indeed God. We even see this uh, very clearly communicated in the famous, uh, what we call the Shema. This is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Uh, it, it literally in the original language says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad. Here, O Israel, our God is one. one. And that word one there, it's interesting that Moses would use the word Echad because he could have used the word Yakid which Yaquid is a very rigid singularity. But it's interesting, he used the same word to describe that relationship that when God created Adam and Eve, he said, Adam and Eve, you are one, Echad. In other words, the word Echad is describing, again, our Lord, our God, Elohim, Adonai. He is Echad. He is one in unity. But how can you take one individual and say, that's a great unity? Mm. <laughs> we know right, that the exactly. Father and the Son share divinity. The Father and the Son are creator. How do we explain that in our finite human minds? We simply can't. It's a mystery. But at the end of the day, we can take what the Bible tells us and we can believe it. We can proclaim it because the scripture is clear. The Bible even goes on to say, meanwhile, that Jesus Christ, in fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, Christ is also called the judge. And you can't call him judge unless obviously by, by that, he is given that name. He's given that title because he has indeed created all things. He is creator. Let's read Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 through 13. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful. What is that word? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We're talking about Jesus Christ. For the right. word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. But here comes the judgment aspect in verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give mm -hmm. account. The fact that he is judge, the fact that he is creator, he is creator, he is judge, but also the Bible goes on to describe Christ by whom God created all things, even the universe. He is the sustainer. Mm. He is the yeah. sustainer of creation. 
Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Notice again what it says. Who That's being right. the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty mm. on high. Even Colossians chapter 1, verse 17 yeah. says, and He is before all things and notice, in Him all things consist. You know what that means? Christ is not only the Creator, but all of creation is consisted. It is sustained through Him. Mm -hmm. And the lesson brings out here the sustaining action probably includes the idea of guidance or governance. Mm -hmm. The Greek word feron, which again goes on to mean sustaining or carrying, is used to describe the wind driving a boat in Acts chapter 27, verses 15 and 17. Or it also describes God leading the prophets in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Thus, in a real sense, Jesus not only created us, but sustains us as well. And I love this. Every breath, every heartbeat, every moment of our existence is found in Him. Jesus, the foundation of, of all created existence. Jesus is the foundation of all. He is the Creator. He is God. And we're just going to leave it at that. <laughs> That's pretty clear. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. We now move to Thursday's portion of this study guide. And the title is Today I Have Begotten You. This is uh, concerning Jesus. Uh, my name is John Dinsey. For those of you listening on radio, there's a different person now speaking. <laughs> so we have in Exodus chapter 2, verse 4, the fact that God heard the Hebrews groaning because of their sufferings. And God remembered His covenant that He made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is a, go a covenant-keeping God. Mm. And the promises we find in the Old Testament, the scriptures we find in the Old Testament, the stories in the Old Testament have uh, what you, you see some of the borrowing in the book of Hebrews. And we're going to talk about uh, one of those uh, right here. In Luke chapter 1, verse 72 and 73, Zacharias made this powerful message, 72, 73, to perform concerning Jesus. He grabbed the child Jesus in his arms and he says, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers mm -hmm. and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swear to our father Abraham. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, came to fulfill the promise. Mm. Now look at Luke chapter 1, verse 31 and 32. No, uh, talking to uh, Mary, the angel says, You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. Mm. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Mm. Now this is powerful. Jesus had serious trouble with the uh, scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were constantly after him to find some fault because he was growing in popularity. He was doing miracles and they were afraid they were losing their influence among, among the people. So in John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jews, and beginning in verse 56, you will hear something marvelous. Notice, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day mm -hmm. and he saw it and was glad. Mm -hmm. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and mm -hmm. hast thou seen Abraham? Mm -hmm. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before mm -hmm. Abraham was, mm -hmm. I am. Amen. Mm -hmm. When he said this, they were shocked. They were uh, uh, indignant. They wanted to <laughs> stone Jesus. This is why verse 59 says, Then took they of stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. They tried to cut his mission short. They tried to stone him to, to death because Jesus said, I am the great mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. And so this is speaking of Jesus. I'm reading to you from Signs of the Times, August 29, 1900. It says, in speaking of his pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through the dateless ages. He assures us that there was never a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. Mm -hmm. He to whose voice the Jews were then listening has 
had been with God as one brought up with him. You see, there was no time in history past, in the eternal history past, that Jesus did not, did not exist. He has always existed. He is eternal. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. Now this will, we focus in on the phrase, um, I have begotten you. Today I have begotten you. Notice mm -hmm. in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. There's so much in this one verse that we don't have all the time to exhaust all that it has here. But yes, there are times in the Bible when angels are referred to sons of God. But this is, a, is separating Jesus from angels because he is the creator. He is God. And there's something that occurs upon a given time. You see, Jesus when he's manifest and when he takes upon himself as, hum, uh, 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 as a human, as human flesh, he is considered the only begotten son of God. But there's another time when we see uh, this phrase, today I have begotten you, and it's very interesting, so I encourage you to listen. The I in the Greek here is emphatic. I, the everlasting Father, have begotten you on this day. That is, on this day, the day of thy being manifested as my Son, the first begotten of the dead. You see, when Jesus Christ comes forth from the grave, there's a revelation and a manifestation in such a sense that the Father declares, this day have I begotten thee. Now, this is interesting because this is taken from Psalm chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Psalms chapters 2, verse 6 and 7. Yet have I set my king over upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Mm -hmm. Now I mentioned earlier that the stories in the past have uh, references in the New Testament as well. You see, the, the whole theocracy, the kingdom of, of, of Israel, had uh, messianic import. And when, uh, actually, this declaration that we find in 2 Psalm, verse 6 and 7, this is a phrase that the Lord uses even for Solomon, uh, where it says, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But this is like uh, Solomon becomes an, a type, and Jesus becomes the anti-type. Mm -hmm. So let's consider this. You see, uh, the type of God's ultimately subduing all enemies under his son also is represented in David. In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 8, you will see a listing of David's victories and the victories David had. And notice what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 8 verse 15. It says, And David reigned over all Israel, and David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. Mm -hmm. So David becomes a type and Christ is the anti-type. Jesus Christ, by coming to this world, becoming uh, human, just like you and I, enduring temptation, just like you and I, being victorious, dying upon the cross for us. And when he dies upon the cross for us and comes forth victorious, resurrected on the third day, he wins the battle. He wins the war. He wins and he becomes the son of God in a sense as being established over the throne uh, that we're going to read in a moment. And so Jesus, just like David, is going to execute justice. He's going to rule over not, not just over Israel, but over the whole world. Jesus Christ will execute judgment for his people. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16, God promised David, I will set up your seat after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. This was because David wanted to build a temple, mm. but he could not. God told him, your son is going to build a temple. And here Solomon becomes a type and Jesus is the anti-type because just like God said to Solomon, God says to his son, I will be to you a father and you shall be to me a son, just as we read in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, 
It says concerning, it says concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the res resurrection from the dead. So when Christ resurrects from the dead, he becomes a here, it's not that he is becoming his son at that time, but it's a manifestation of a prior sonship. He was already the son before he rose from the dead. And so I tell you, in Mark chapter 1, a declaration is made by the centurion. Notice Mark 51, Mark 15, verse 39. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Praise the Lord. You see, Christ has existed forever. He, as the Son of God, came to die for us. And so, quickly, let me read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Christ has been victorious, died for us, being high and king. He left the adoration of angels and became a babe, and he is our king. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much. Wonderful. I don't think there's any doubt about that any longer, but I'm going to give each one of our panelists an opportunity to summarize the day they covered. James? All right. Well, the day we covered was Monday. God has spoken to us by his son. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 said that Jesus Christ says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God is a communicator, and sin didn't stop God from communicating with us. God communicates with us. He has communicated with us, and He'll continue to communicate with us. And the communication that He has for us is the revelation of His love, His goodness, that leads us to turn our lives around and give our hearts to Him. Amen. Jill? On Tuesday, we looked at Jesus being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And I just want to touch on this. Many times we feel like God is harsh. The God of the Old Testament is vengeful and vindictive. But the truth is Jesus came to reveal the Father. And that means that God is love and God wants to save you. Amen. Amen. The first chapter of Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, as well as the very last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 13 says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the end, the first and the last. Both, both, obviously both, ref, both referring to Jesus Christ. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. Make Him Lord of your life today. Amen. Amen. We have in the book of Genesis that Adam and Eve were given dominion and they lost it when they sinned and Satan seemed to take it from them. But Christ, by dying on the cross for us, a perfect sacrifice, he has taken that dominion mm -hmm. back and he will establish a kingdom that will last forever. And I hope you are part of it. Amen. 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 Thank you Amen. so much, each one of you, for talking about the promised son. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a statement I heard growing up. It's called promises, promises. Mm. God made a promise and Jesus is the fulfillment of that divine promise. So we can have today the blessed assurance that the Christ who came to earth to redeem us will come again to deliver us. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much that Jesus is in fact the promise of God. Mm -hmm. Lesson number four we're going to be covering next week. We'd like to invite you to come back and join us on that. It's Jesus, our faithful brother. Mm -hmm. When he walked the earth, he also became somebody closer than our closest friend, Join us next week for that exciting lesson study on Hebrews.